Hello everyone, I'm Paris Fox, and I'd like to welcome you to 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox, hosted by Richard Lummis. Hello and welcome to another episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast about leadership. It's Richard Lummis, I'm here with Tom Fox for another discussion on how to improve our leadership skills. We believe leadership is a skill which can be improved with study of both good and bad practices, and we'll try to draw interesting examples from many sources, including history, fiction, film, and business writing. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Richard. Today we're going to continue our series on U.S. presidents with the relatively unknown John Tyler, who was 10th president. He's the first president to succeed to the presidency when William Henry Harrison died one month into his term, which is one of the things we'll be discussing. Tom, where would you like to start with Mr. Tyler? Well, uh, Richard, actually, I'd, I'd first like to we rarely, uh, properly, I would say, rarely uh, go too political on this podcast, but there were some things that really struck me about the Tyler administration that I re- just wanted to highlight uh, to try to make clear to our listeners and our audience that whatever you may or may not think of the current political situation, uh, the United States has certainly had many other situations where um, it was equally crazy. (laughs) And uh, frankly, I was just stunned. So let me just kind of run down the list of uh, issues that President Tyler had to face. And uh, uh, number one, started out, he was not viewed as a legitimate president because he ascended uh, via the Constitution, was not elected. He was the first president against whom impeachment proceedings were brought. Uh, He was the first president with no real political base He had been a lifelong Democrat, and he was in the Whig Party. He was the first president to veto congressional legislation based on policy, not on constitutional grounds. He was the first president to face a mass resignation of his cabinet, where uh, on September 11th of all dates, um, 1843, his entire cabinet, save one, resigned. He was the first president to have cabinet nominees defeated, He governed during the tail end of a six-year economic turndown, which was started with the crash of 1837 and extended into his um, presidency. And finally, he was the uh, last president before Abraham Lincoln to face an armed and open rebellion in one of the states of the Union. Uh, And that was in a good three years and 11 months. So it just drove home to me that uh, this country has had uh, a very uh, checkered past in terms of uh, political stability or instability. And as I said, you and I uh, both grew up in the 60s, uh, so certainly there was uh, craziness, chaos, and lots of conflict there, and of course Watergate. Uh, and those, for me, were probably the Watergate being probably the most seminal political event of my lifetime. But in our study of presidents, I think uh, I have learned that um, the uh, uh, political conflicts, political instability, and political even chaos is not new to this administration. And so um, maybe it's just time to, uh, as my wife would say, have a cup of coffee, or she would say have a cup of tea and keep calm. <laughs> it's just stunned. Yeah. Well, I knew very little about Tyler uh, before researching this. And um, uh, the other thing is, I think, he was, I think he was the first president to have his veto overridden. Yes, and I'm going to get into that too. Yeah, and um, he was actually expelled by his political party. Yes. Um, and so, yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And I was also unaware that the uh, the Constitution, as originally written, was uh, was very vague on whether the vice president could even succeed the, to the presidency on the death. And so that was one of the principles that Tyler actually uh, established and is, is probably best known for now. Correct. So, uh, in terms of uh, leadership, maybe we can go through, um, you have, uh, I think you probably are, have enjoyed studying this a little bit more than myself, but you've really talked about in prior podcasts, Tippica New and Tyler too in the election, so I'm really going to leave that if you have any thoughts on that, um, to really his ascension to the presidency and the establishment of what's known as the Tyler Principle. Uh, you're absolutely correct that he, uh, it was unclear uh, in the original Constitution, or at least as the Constitution was originally drafted, how the uh, a vice president might take over. But um, Tyler um, was very decisive in taking the reins of the presidency and taking the oath of office and um, becoming president. Uh, so that he set the president, precedent called the Tyler Principle, 
which has now been uh, put, uh, I think, firmly uh, in the American consciousness. Uh, but he was the first one to do it, and it was unclear what exactly the role would be, whether he would be acting president, whether he would be simply be a caretaker until the next election, whether he'd even be a, a more regency. Uh, but he made clear that he was the president and that uh, in the first cabinet meeting he held, uh, one of the cabinet members, uh, um, I believe Win Winfield Scott, said that, well, uh, under um, um, the prior president, William Henry Harrison, uh, the cabinet would vote, and uh, William Henry Harrison would follow the, the wishes of the cabinet that the president had one vote. And um, President Tyler said that uh, he would not be, uh, uh, he would certainly thank them for their advice and counsel, but that he was the president, and he would never consent to being dictated to by his administration. And that, uh, frankly, if they didn't like that, they could resign. So uh, he made clear that uh, from literally the day that uh, Harrison died uh, to when he took the, the oath of office within a couple of days, that he saw himself as the president. And, and that decisiveness, I don't know if Lyndon Johnson drew inspiration from that after the assassination of uh, President Kennedy, or perhaps he had other reasons for um, you know, taking the oath of office literally in, the, in uh, Air Force One, uh, but uh, I think we can uh, really owe John Tyler, uh, if certainly we sitting here in Texas owe a little bit to him for the annexation of Texas, but uh, the Tyler principle on ascension of the vice president in the event of the death of the president, uh, certainly until this was cleared up uh, by the 26th Amendment, I believe, um, is something that we should uh, uh, really acknowledge and, and salute uh, President Tyler for. I, I agree. The um it's kind of interesting that um, no one's really sure how he became, how he got the nomination for vice president, really. Um, there was, um, um, he was a slave owner, um, and uh, Harrison was, uh, I think, uh, from Ohio. Yes. And uh, so he was suspected of possibly being, uh, having anti-slavery leanings, and so uh, Tyler balanced the ticket. But he was pretty much, He'd served in the in Congress and Senate and the House of uh, Delegates in Virginia, so, um, and he grew up in a in the Tidewater uh, area of Virginia, um, surrounded by the founding fathers, basically. Um, so, but I think he was just regarded as sort of a non-entity, though. Oh, I for, there was one really interesting point I, I forgot to mention in uh, the uh, opening part about his ascension to the presidency. Many viewed him as never actually being the president and indeed being the outlaw president. And I thought he took this to the ultimate uh, nth degree when after he left the presidency and bought a new plantation, he renamed it Sherwood Forest. Yes. <laughs> so uh, that was a, a great play. But on the uh, uh, naming uh, President um, or John Tyler to the vice president, I agree with uh, your analysis that he was there to balance the ticket. He was a... Uh, the, it was the first Whig convention where they nominated a uh, candidate for the presidency, and they clearly, um, I don't know if they didn't know what they were doing, but it was uh, not very well organized, and there were multiple ballots, and um, uh, Winfield Scott was a candidate at one point, but it was determined he was too pro-slavery, and so uh, um, the um, uh, weight was thrown to Harrison, and then Tyler came on as a former Democrat, uh, to try to bring that uh, into the uh, into the uh, uh, ticket, uh, and for uh, a leadership lesson, this this may be more of a corporate lesson. But one of the pieces we read said that uh, due diligence and vetting of your candidates is absolutely critical, because if they had done that, they would have seen the proclim the actions that Tyler took as a congressman, as a senator, as a uh, member of the Virginia House of Delegates, clearly uh, presaged and portended. Uh, his uh, his leanings as president, he really never was a Whig. He was always a Democrat, and um, that was uh, became painfully clear to the Whigs, and we'll get into that a little bit. But the um, um, ascension uh, and then the, the campaign, uh, and during the campaign, um, the Whigs really didn't even uh, have a platform other than they were against Martin Van Buren. Yeah, and. The one time Tyler began to give a speech, he gave one speech and it was so criticized because it announced some policy provision that they were uh, re re uh, had him not uh, talk something to leave for the rest of the campaign. And um, if you want one more parallel to the current political situation, 
I thought I found that one really interesting. We're not for anything, but we're against him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, I guess one of the other little quirks is that uh, at his death, he was not a U.S. citizen. He was a citizen of the Confederacy. And, uh, <laughs> you know, yes, uh, you're absolutely right. He was the uh, the only uh, former president, I think, to be a citizen of not a citizen of the United States. Certainly, the citizen of the Confederacy. He was uh, greatly honored uh, upon his death um, by the then president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis. Yes, uh, very interesting. Um, his slavery, his position on slavery, is kind of interesting, though. He um, he recognized the immorality of it, basically, and hoped that it would wither away. Uh, he had this. Uh, concept called diffusion, that by uh, constantly growing America, that the slave population would become attenuated and spread out, and it would just eventually vanish. Um, Not terribly coherent intellectually, but um, it certainly was one of the driving forces behind his belief that uh, America should expand geographically. Uh, Diffusion and attenuation, those were two terms of American history I was not familiar with. So, uh, and it was interesting, and I think it was uh, a theory that many Southerners uh, at the time, if they didn't um, publicly espouse, they believed that, and they hoped that there might be some logical end uh, to this, uh, the South, South peculiar institution. Because uh, even by the early 1840s, I think uh, many recognized that uh, the United States was moving out of the mainstream of literally the, re- the west of the rest of the civilized world on, on that point, but they weren't moving with uh, very much speed. Well, and it, it was one of the causes of uh, dissension with uh, Great Britain. Um, Tyler, of course, had grown up surrounded by people who fought in the Revolution and was quite anti-British. Um, and Britain at the time was uh, beginning a campaign to uh, eliminate slavery. Um, or the slave trade out of West Africa. Um, Harrison actually ended up, uh, as part of one of his treaties, um, the U.S. Navy joined Great Britain in the effort to eradicate the uh, West Indies slave trade. And in the sec- next area of the Tyler presidency I wanted to focus on for some leadership lessons was really I've, I've, I've uh, lumped together uh, the second bill, or rather a bill to rather uh, a bill to um, enact a new Bank of America and economic tariffs. So I'm going to call these economic issues. But there were two uh, bank charters passed. Uh, the first one he um, vetoed, and these were brought up uh, by Henry Clay, who was one of the Whig leaders in the Senate. And a second bill was brought up uh, originally to uh, uh, meet the uh, tailor to meet the objections of. Tyler's first veto, but uh, then the final bill, it, it failed to meet those, so he vetoed these both of these bills twice. And uh, it was after that, that uh, that time, that we had the mass resignation of the cabinet on September 11th, 1841. I'm sorry, I said 1842 a little bit earlier. And it was after that time that um, uh, impeachment proceedings uh, were instituted in the House. And this is because, once again, this was the first time that a Uh, President had vetoed a bill based upon a policy reason and not uh, unconstitutionality. But the the economic uh, issues that I found perhaps a little bit more interesting, um, because we had seen the debate about the Bank of America bill before, was the tariff. And um, for those who who may not recall, uh, under President Jackson, there was a nullification crisis in 1832 around uh, tariffs in South Carolina. And uh, part of the compromise which averted that crisis was a 10-year tariff of twenty, no more than 20% with a distributions to the state of uh, certain monies uh, from the collected tariffs. The North generally wanted tariffs to uh, protect their nascent industries, and the South did not want tariffs because they were uh, producing raw materials, and they wanted to be able to get their raw materials uh, into market so that they could sell them. And so... Uh, it all tied together with uh, the crash from 1837 and the uh, economic um, downturn, which was still going on in the Tyler administration. And so uh, what President Tyler had to do was try and increase the tariff, uh, but bumping up against that uh, 20% uh, rule uh, was constraining the ability of the federal government to meet its debts, which at this point had the uh, awesome 
deficit of $11 million. <laughs> and uh, he um, was able to get through uh, his bill, which was the bill he wanted was to raise the tariff, yet not increase the distribution so that the federal government kept all the money. And he did this by, uh, once again, vetoing a couple of bills that Congress sent to him until they split the two issues uh, in, into a distribution bill and a tariff raising bill. He uh, approved the tariff raise uh, and then let the uh, distribution bill um, die in a pocket veto, uh, which, as I recall from my uh, government class, meant that uh, he went more than simply 10 days um, during a recess, I think. Right. Uh, he just didn't sign it. And didn't sign it. So um, he was able to uh, get these uh, get the tariffs uh, increased, and um, at, uh, I guess it was after uh, these issues when the impeach- impeachment proceedings uh, were um, uh, instituted. So uh, pretty interesting, I thought. Um, his he he really was a skilled operator in uh, political uh, calculus of Washington at the time, and he consistently outmaneuvered uh, the members of his, uh, not only his own party, but the opposition. And you brought up a key point, which was, it was after the um, a vetoing, vetoing of the distribution bill, he was actually expelled from the Whig Party. Okay. So we had uh, what used to be the anomaly of a president really without a party. Yeah. And um, this had never happened uh, in the history of the country before, unless you perhaps count George Washington, which was above party. Nevertheless, uh, Tyler still executed, I thought, a, uh, a robust, uh, uh, if not domestic, certainly uh, foreign policy that uh, we'll talk about some of those things, but um, kicked out of his own pol- uh, party. Well, one of the biographies made the point that one of Tyler's real weaknesses was that he was unimpressive to most people, that he never came across as uh, the, the smartest guy in the room or the most skilled but as you pointed out, if you look at his actual achievements, especially given the lack of political backing uh, by his well, former party, I guess, um, he really accomplished a lot. Um, and one of the other things you mentioned uh, in the introduction was uh, the armed insurrection, which right. was something I knew nothing about. It's called the Door Rebellion in uh, Rhode Island. Yes. And uh, you want to address that a bit? So there were some insurgents uh, who uh, uh, literally took control or at least set up a parallel Rhode Island government. Rhode Island was operating under a constitutional structure which had been established in 1663. And for those who might recall, uh, uh, our American history, Rhode Island was really a breakaway colony from Massachusetts, founded by Roger Williams. And uh, the uh, uh, official government called for troops to be sent in and asked for uh, Tyler for help to actually put de- physically put down the rebellion with uh, U.S. Army troops. And uh, Tyler promised that in the case of an actual insurrection uh, where there was armed conflict, he would do so. But he um, researched the situation and he studied the situation. And what he found was, I don't want to say that they were blowhards uh, because I think they had some legitimate grievances, but what he found was that there were lawless assemblages of men uh, who um, had set up this parallel government and they sort of just... Uh, ran out of gas and dispersed on on their own, and that um, he uh, Tyler is alleged to have said uh, that the temper of conciliation as well as the ener- energy uh, and decision uh, need not require federal forces. And I thought this was just a, an absolutely uh, not only a brilliant political stroke, but it was also something that uh, really something that we don't perhaps addressed directly enough in this podcast, which is sometimes you really should study a situation. There are certainly times when dynamic leadership is required, and Tyler showed that uh, on the Tyler principle of ascending to, from vice president to become president. But sometimes if you study something, the energy that has created what may seem to be a problem may actually dissipate on its own. And I think that's what dis, uh, happened in the Dora Rebellion. And um, I didn't find any Um, loss of life on this uh, rebellion. Now, the um, state militia was called out, and they moved against the door and his rebels, and they did cross the state line to get out of uh, uh, the Rhode Island militia's arms way, but no one was arrested, no one was killed, no one was executed, and uh, it just dissipated itself. Yeah, just the virtue of restraint in that particular issue. Um, 
One of the other uh, accomplishments uh, was that he entered into a, a treaty with China where they granted the United States actually even superior privileges to those which, had, which England had extorted from them following the conclusion of the Opium War. Um, and that was really one of the first times, I think, that uh, America's role in the world was, was seen as almost on a par with Great Britain in, in foreign affairs. Uh, you're absolutely right, and uh, that trade uh, that treaty was approved by the Senate, but there were two other things in the for, uh, this realm of foreign affairs that really struck me, Richard. Uh, the first one was um, he sent a ambassador, or a minister rather, Henry Wheaton to Britain, who negotiated uh, with a, a group called, I'm going to butcher this, but it's Zolverin, Zolverin, or something. Anyway. Zolverin. Zolverin, thank you. It's a coalition of German states. And for those who might not recall, Germany was unified in 1848, but it was not unified in 1841 and 1842. So to get a tariff uh, bill uh, together, you had to negotiate with multiple uh, principalities and German states. And uh, Tyler's representative was uh, able to do that to get a trade deal for the United States. Unfortunately, this was rejected by the Whigs, uh, mainly as a show towards hostility to the um, Tyler administration. But there was one other thing that I thought was quite interesting, which was his extension of the Monroe Doctrine to Hawaii. Yes. And I was not aware of that. I was certainly aware of the extension of the Monroe Doctrine to the Roosevelt Corollary, but uh, I thought the Monroe Doctrine sort of applied in uh, North and South America. And when I thought about it, I did realize that Hawaii's probably in the Western Hemisphere. So uh, if, if the Monroe Doctrine is designed to apply to the Western Hemisphere, arguably it could work. Nevertheless, uh, the invocation of the Monroe Doctrine, I thought was an interesting use of a foreign affairs tool. Uh, Monroe Doctrine basically told Britain not to uh, interfere in the Western Hemisphere. That was uh, our pond and here we extended it to the Pacific Ocean. Well, and that was another instance, I think, where Great Britain actually showed a fair amount of restraint. Um, while it was going, while the question of the United States recognizing Hawaii as, uh, as an independent nation was, was being discussed, um, a British captain, British naval captain, had actually threatened to bombard Honolulu and insisted that they fly the British flag. Um, and so that was the background that uh, Britain was sort of threatening to annex Hawaii. And um, again, Tyler skillfully negotiated uh, the, with Britain, and they, they withdrew. Captain had basically gone rogue. He was out operating without instructions. Um, but so once again, he, um, he managed to put the United States in a, um, in a very good light with respect to uh, foreign countries. Um, and then the next thing was um, the annexation of Texas. And <clears throat> this is something that um, we studied in Texas history uh, in junior high school. Uh, nevertheless, it was great to review it because it's, uh, and, and if I could cite another source, uh, Arthur Schlesinger, after Watergate, wrote a, a very influential book for me called The Imperial Presidency. And it was about the growth and extension of the power of the presidency up through Richard Nixon. And one of the opening chapters was on the annexation of Texas uh, because um, by hook, nook, crook, Tyler was going to annex Texas. This was highly controversial, uh, mainly because Texas would come in as a slave state. And at that point, we had an equally divided uh, North and South so that in, in the Senate, this, uh, there would always be a uh, constraint by the South and they could block anything that the North might do to abolish slavery. So uh, the annexation of Texas was a, um, always a controversial topic, and Tyler worked to do this. He did this for a couple of reasons. One is he was a Jacksonian Democrat by nature, and so uh, I think he wanted to do it for that reason. But he also saw the annexation of Texas as a, as a path for re-election. He did not have a political party, uh, was not part of a political party at this point, either the Whigs had expelled him, and the Democrats had not uh, embraced him fully <laughs> or even welcomed him back. So uh, he viewed this as a key uh, uh, key stepping stone to moving towards um, uh, being reelected. 
And this really ties together with something that uh, I was completely unfamiliar with. I think you had some familiarity, uh, which was the, something called the Princeton Incident. And uh, I was uh, rather stunned to um, read about one description of uh, the Princeton Incident as follows. Prior, uh, prior to the Civil War and the assassination of Abraham Lincoln, the Princeton disaster was unquestionably the most severe and debilitating tragedy ever to confront a president of the United States. The Princeton disaster was uh, a, US, a U.S. warship called the Princeton was sailing on the Potomac and uh, it fired off several uh, ceremonial salutes of a very new and large gun. I don't know the inch size. 12 inch. 12 inch gun called the Peacemaker. And um, at some point uh, in the ceremony, uh, one more round was asked to be shot off and it was. And unfortunately, at that point, uh, the gun failed, blew up and killed a numerous amount of people, including two key members of Tyler's administration, Thomas Gilmer and Abel Upshur. And those two men uh, apparently had the wherewithal, uh, at least historians think, and certainly President Tyler thought, to have um, Texas annexed via treaty. And uh, as the Princeton uh, disaster took these two men out, it ended the hope of Tyler um, annexing Texas during his administration uh, via treaty. Um, so any thoughts on the Princeton incident, or what did your research show you? Well, there are a couple of interesting things about it. It was, uh, it was actually designed by John Erickson, who later oh. became famous for uh, building the Monitor, um, the first uh, ironclad. Um, it, it was a screw-powered ship. Uh, he designed the engines so that they were mounted below the waterline, where they would be uh, impervious to uh, cannon fire. There were actually two large cannons on it, um, one called the Peacemaker, and the other one was called the Oregon. The Oregon was actually made in England, and it did not explode. Uh, it was made using a technique that Erickson had perfected, where hot, uh, red-hot iron bands were used to uh, strengthen the breach. The Peacemaker had been designed by the captain of the Princeton and uh, did not uh, take advantage of Erickson's technology. And so it was basically a bomb waiting to happen. So uh, back to the story of the annexation. Um, with the death of these two men um, and the impending uh, 1844 election, it was uh, becoming clear that uh, annexation would not happen. Uh, and indeed, when it was uh, brought up for a vote in the Senate um, via treaty, it was defeated by a vote of 16 to 35. Part of those 35 were Whigs, and part of those 35 were Democrats, who still did not support President Tyler. Um, subsequently, uh, Tyler recognized he was not going to be able to garner a nomination of either party, nor did he have the wherewithal to create his own party. And so he withdrew from the presidential race in favor of John Tyler, the Democratic candidate. And the Democrats, through their support, uh, to Tyler for annexing Texas. But here's the part that I found most interesting, the part Arthur Schlesinger, I think, uh, criticized, which was that he did not uh, try to have Texas brought into the U.S. via treaty, and I would say treaty because at that point Texas was an independent nation. So um, he did it via a uh, simple uh, resolution. Mm -hmm. And that was uh, Schlesinger's criticism of usurp usurpation of presidential powers, um, but he was able to get uh, the resolution, joint resolution, offering annexation of Texas passed in February 1845 by a 27 to 25 majority. Uh, now, um, uh, there was still some debate in Texas on the terms of the treaty, and it was not admitted to the Union until the uh, presidency of James K. Polk uh, in uh, December uh, 1845. Nevertheless, um, in February of 1845, uh, the resolution was passed. And that really, I thought, was a, a, another very excellent leadership lesson and really the two I had known about from Tyler before we researched uh, for this podcast. The annexation uh, strategy that he used, he had a very firm strategy in place. He had um, purged his cabinet and his uh, uh, staff of 
anti-annexation people. So he had a pro-annexation team. He had a pro-annexation message, and he was on message until the Princeton disaster. After the Princeton disaster, he was not going to be able to get it through a treaty, but he saw that uh, with the support of the Democrats, he could uh, pass it via resolution, and I thought that was an excellent example of uh, how you can change your strategy, uh, change your tactics rather, so that you're uh, at the end of the day, if you haven't won the battle, you've won the war. Yeah. There are a couple of other things that uh, happened during his administration. One was the uh, settlement of the boundary, northern boundary of Maine with, with yes. England, which uh, nearly caused a war. Um, and it Part of that was uh, Tyler had a penchant for using the off-the-books budget that was uh, for basically espionage to appoint private uh, agents and not use the typical State Department apparatus in his negotiations uh, with England. But he also apparently slathered money around Maine to uh, unconstitutionally and illegally in order to uh, get support for the new proposed uh, budget. Or boundary, excuse me. Might one say he greased it? Yes. <laughs> there's a reason they're called grease payments. Yes. Well, Richard, there's a couple of other points that I'd like to just sort of end with uh, for today's podcast, which is one of the crucial lessons, I think, from Tyler is that presidents uh, should never be underestimated. Yeah. Uh, and uh, certainly John Tyler uh, showed he was a very able a legislator and was able to get through, uh, as you pointed out uh, on the uh, treaty with Great Britain, um, uh, actually uh, Daniel Webster headed up that negotiation, uh, so yet another uh, famous Whig. But uh, he should not have been underestimated. He was underestimated by his enemies. I don't think he had too many friends left. So um, the second thing is that uh, in addition to the annex- annexation of Texas, Really, I think we do owe a firm debt to John Tyler for uh, de- demonstrating that a peaceful transition of power can occur even in the most dire circumstances, which were uh, the, the death of a president. Yeah, uh, I agree. And this one was really interesting because I knew virtually nothing about Tyler uh, again. So um, we will continue our uh, series on the presidents in a couple of weeks when we come back to President Polk. Uh, and more about Texas, I'm sure. But uh, until then, this is Richard Lummis and Tom Fox for 12 O'Clock High. This is Paris Fox again. We hope you enjoyed this episode of 12 O'Clock High, a podcast on business leadership with Tom Fox. If you enjoyed the show, please go to iTunes and rate the podcast. Thank you for listening.